I suppose the, the, the existential question of the hour is, uh, will the euro survive? Will Greece stay in the eurozone? And if it doesn't, what's that going to mean for everybody else? Uh, and I think that is a question which is probably best answered by looking not at the economics, but at the politics. Uh, the European Union uh, was put together very painfully as a result of you know, two, uh, a prolonged European civil war in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, active warfare between 1914 and 1918, between 1939 and 1945. But it was really sort of one civil war, really, with two episodes. And in the wake of that, uh, there was a determination that this would never happen again and that a political structure would be established in Europe to guarantee such a degree of mutual interdependence between the Europeans, uh, economically speaking first, and therefore subsequently politically speaking, so that they literally physically would be so close together that they'd be like boxers in a clinch. They wouldn't have enough room to swing a punch at one another. Uh, I think uh, not everybody, uh, shall we say, uh, in Europe uh, and in parts of the world which are sympathetic to Europe have understood that this is first and foremost a political project with a political goal deriving from a searing historical experience that Europe suffered in the first half of the 20th century. It's not primarily uh, or even mainly about currency or about open markets or about common agricultural policies, our regional policies, are all those good things that certainly this country has benefited enormously from. It is about building a structure, a structure of peace in Europe. And I think the, 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 the most uh, important lesson to derive from a discussion about the possibility of the euro breaking up is that it is like you know, a, a piece of, of tread that's coming out of a, a garment, that if you pull at it, eventually the whole garment will disappear if you keep pulling at it. And, and, and if, if Greece, in my conviction, were to leave the euro, uh, certainly if we were to leave the euro um, under duress, that that would essentially be the end of the euro. Because the, the euro is based fundamentally on the idea that this currency union is irreversible. That statement, that understanding that it's irreversible is what holds it together. But if for Greece to leave, the whole assumption underlying the existence of the euro would change because it would now be a reversible currency. And that, of course, would immediately invite you know, speculation against Ireland, against Portugal, against Italy, against Spain, and soon the whole thing would break. That, of course, would uh, lead to, and I, I think it's important to, to look at the, the mo most recent example of a major currency union breaking up in Europe. And it happened in the lifetime of everybody here in this room, although we probably weren't focusing on what was happening as a breakup of an, a currency union. But that's what it was. And that is when the, the ruble zone broke up 1990, between 1990 and 1993. The ruble zone, the ruble was the currency, as you know, of the Soviet Union. And when it broke up, uh, there was competitive uh, devaluation, competitive uh, printing of money by the new authorities in Kazakhstan and Lithuania, all the different places. There was inflation running at around 100%. And an average fall right across the board in the gross domestic product per capita of all of the people, both the creditor country, which is Russia, the equivalent of Germany, and the uh, debtor countries, everybody else, the equivalent of almost everybody else in Europe, apart from the Finns and the, 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 the Swedes. There was, uh, 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 and, the, and the Dutch, I think, a, dro a drop of, of about 50, 52% in gross GDP per head. And, and uh, literally, a starvation. People starved, starved in Russia and in the former Soviet Union. Starved, died of malnutrition uh, because of what happened as a direct consequence of the sort of ultimate breakdown in confidence rising from 
a breakup of a currency union. So those who talk, you know, those who are talk blithely about the about the uh, the breakup of the eurozone, who are thinking in terms like what well, it's like Britain leaving the ERM. It'll be painful for a short while, and then you, as Britain did, you get a bounce. It's not the same if you're actually pulling apart a complete currency union. And of course, the currency union of the um, European Union is much more significant in global terms and much larger in the population affected than the euro, the, the ruble zone was. So we're, we're talking, you know, we're talking very, very major, uh, major risks here. Uh, there is a, an assumption, of course, and uh, if you read the blogs and so forth, you'll, you'll see this assumption frequently expressed, that, well, the breakup of the Eurozone would be so serious that it won't happen. Well, I think probably you should read <clears throat> The March of Folly by Barbara Tuckman, which is a, a, his, a history that described, amongst other things, the, the way in which everybody agreed that there should not have been war in September 19, in August 1914. Everybody was agreed that it shouldn't happen. Everybody was prepared for it, but everybody was agreed it shouldn't happen. And the points at issue were minor and easily settleable. They, you could say they, they boiled down to whether there should be an Austrian inspector overseeing the Serbian court when it was trying certain individuals who were suspected of cross-border terrorism. A manageable issue, but an issue that wasn't managed. And eventually, all of the countries of Europe, including this one, were drawn into a war which you know, was one of the most terrible wars in human history. So just because people know <laughs> that the collapse would be a disaster and know how they should avoid it doesn't mean that they will avoid it because the, 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 the system of organization that we have in the European Union for making political decisions isn't efficient enough. And it isn't efficient because all of the individual countries in the European Union, all of them, wanted only to get control over other countries in respect of the things that they wanted other countries to do, but not to have other countries mutually having control over them in things that they prefer to do for themselves. And everybody had a different agenda as far as what they wanted to reserve to themselves and a different agenda as to the things they wanted uh, to uh, have others um, uh, under their thumb for or under majority rule in respect of. And the result is we have a very patchwork system of decision making. We don't really have uh, someone with democratic legitimacy who's in charge. Uh, and I think that's you know, the big difference between ourselves and the United States. The United States has a president who ultimately can't blame anyone else. He can try, but he will rarely succeed. In Europe, everybody, no matter how elevated, uh, has the capacity to blame somebody else. The Germans can blame the Greeks, the Greeks can blame the Germans, the Irish can blame, we used to blame the British, we can't blame the British anymore, but we can blame the Germans uh, now, and so on. Uh, and there is this, this sort of a situation that exists, and that's the sort of the architecture is incoherent because while our economics is European, our politics is still national. And we haven't been able to, you know, yet come up with the solution. And that's why I think uh, Angela Merkel is right in saying that to resolve the currency crisis, we must create a political union. Now, that doesn't mean that every detail of political decision-making in every country in Europe is going to be decided in Europe rather than, uh, at European level rather than at national level. But it does mean that there is a sense of responsibility and accountability and democratic legitimacy at European level. That's equivalent to the responsibilities that are being exercised at European level. And we're looking now at the you know, likelihood of um, certainty, I think, that we're going to have to introduce a banking union in Europe. That's going to mean that uh, the deposits of Irish banks will be guaranteed by the German, uh, German bank deposits. And the deposits of German banks equally importantly, will be guaranteed by, by the deposits and the support systems in Ireland. Mutual deposit guarantees. That's something that we're going to have to have, I think. 
we're going to have to have a European authority that can close down banks and withdraw banking licenses from banks. It's not going to be possible, I think, to have a deposit guarantee scheme without having the possibility of somebody uh, on behalf of all the guarantors external to the country in question being able to close the bank down if it's not trading uh, in accordance with, with rules. But that's going to, I think, lead to you know, a sense of who's politically ultimately responsible for making the decisions to close down this bank. Who's responsible for ensuring that my deposits are not going to be levied at too high a, um, a, a level of levy to pay for deposit guarantees for shaky banks in other countries that haven't been adequately um, supervised. I think it's also important to stand back from the current economic debate about these matters of finance to which I've been making uh, reference and to see it in its, in its wider perspective. It is a crisis of confidence in money, a confidence in, in banks, in other banks. Finance has been renationalized, and huge new inefficiencies have been introduced into the financial system as a result of the renationalization, the retreat to the national boundary of our banking systems. It's a crisis of global money, if you like. There's also underlying that a crisis of, a crisis of demographics. Uh, for example, the Danish government, which is, I think, a centre-left government at the moment, recently produced a, a study about what Denmark would look like in 2035. And they had to admit that in 2035, given the age structure of Denmark as it is today, they won't be able to afford a welfare state. The welfare state will basically have to be you know, substantially wound up by 2035. Uh, and if you look at growth potential of individual countries in Europe, you can see why that's going to be the case. The, the OECD did a study to, to look, and I think this is important when people are thinking about making demands on the Germans uh, for you know, more guarantees and more spending. The OECD looked at a, a, a study of growth potential in, in European countries between 2016 and 2025 looking at demography, looking at you know, the age structure, what people are able to do and what they're likely to be able to do between 2016 and 2025. Um, and they discovered that the growth potential per annum of Germany in that period would be 1.2%. The growth potential of France would be 1.7%. The growth potential of Italy would be just 1.5%. But interestingly enough, the growth potential of Spain would be 2.5% and the growth potential of Ireland, 2.7%. So it could well be that you know, we, we in this country will be having to help out some of the countries that will be helping us out now if that's the way growth potential turns out. But I don't think there's any work being done to prepare people politically for that idea of genuine reciprocity. Particularly in this country, we uh, have become attuned to the idea that Europe is there to give us money. It's not there for us to give them money. And we've been you know, able to benefit enormously from you know, things that were done for other purposes. The common agricultural policy was introduced so that the French would be compensated for allowing German goods into their market. The European regional funds were introduced so that the British could be compensated with the fact that they were putting too much money into the common treasury and because their agriculture was too small and relatively efficient, they weren't getting much out. So the regional fund was invented to give the British some money. In both cases, of course, the Irish were able to benefit from both of these schemes, even though neither of them was particularly intended for us. And we have had this pattern of you know, doing pretty well, uh, opportunistically, out of whatever compromises were made to deal with other causes. And of course, that's absolutely right. I mean, in, in selfish and self-interest terms, it's exactly what you should do. On the other hand, at the end of the day, a time will come when one must recognize that this is a mutual arrangement and that there's got to be reciprocity. And one has got to give as well as take. And we in this country, I think, have not been prepared for that and are going to have to be prepared for giving a little as well as taking. 
Um, I, 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 I know, I mean, I, I, I'd be happy if there's time or if you have a, an interest to, to, to have a discussion with you. I'm conscious of some of the topics that I might be touching on. You know more about them than I do, and what I can bring to them is not so much raw knowledge as a political perspective. So I look forward to a bit of discussion with you, 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 you afterwards. But I, I do think, we, to sum up, we have um, very different politics in each of the important countries. Uh, and we have an awful lot of questions. Will Britain still be in the European Union 10 years from now? Uh, will, Italy, uh, will Italy become Eurosceptic? Will Spain hang together? Uh, within Germany, they're tired in southern Germany of transferring mon's money to the east. And why, after all the investment in the east, has there not been more economic growth in East Germany than there's been? The Germans are sort of not too keen on that. And that inhibits them, particularly when you look at the age structure of Germany and the growth potential of Germany, to which I referred earlier, that inhibits them from you know, taking on southern Europe as well as eastern Germany uh, as something that they're going to support. These are hugely um, important political questions where a better understanding on the part of citizens is essential if the project um, is to work. Um, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'll just say a few words, if I may, about the Irish, uh, the Irish, my own role, which is uh, as a sort of ambassador for the financial, international financial services industry here in Ireland. Now, at this firm, uh, KPMG, has been extremely active in this field. The level of expertise that we have in this firm and in other firms in the financial services sector is one of the reasons why Ireland has become such a successful, in Dublin particularly, such a successful financial services centre. If people could not be confident coming in here to set up a fund or to set up an international bank or to establish a reinsurance subsidiary or to do their aviation leasing here in Ireland, they weren't confident that the auditing firms, the accounting firms, the legal firms were prepared and able to give them the best possible advice that they could get on a global basis and give it to them in the world language of business, English, give it to them in a system of law, the common law, which is also understood on the other side of the Atlantic. If it wasn't for that professional infrastructure, we would not have the industry that we have. And I want to say this, if I may, that KPMG in particular has been very generous with, their, with your time and expertise to, um, to IFSC Ireland, the body that I represent, in, you know, in, in supporting us with, with, with your knowledge and background information uh, at various times. But... Ireland is a good place to put up a business like this. As I said, we've one of the highest growth potentials in Europe in the medium term. Our average age is only 35. We're one of the lowest age, age profile, I think, in the, in, in, the European, in the European zone. Dublin has been rated by the Economic Intelligence Unit as having the best access to human capital in all of Europe. Uh, as a result, in part of that, we have a funds industry with 2 trillion euros under management here in Dublin. Uh, we're the, by far the fastest growing location in Europe for our usage. Uh, and we're also developing, you know, similarly in other, in other, in other types, hedge funds and other types of, of, of a, a, a activity. There are 32,000, uh, more than 32,000 people working in the, finan in, the, in, the, in the financial services industry generally here. Uh, I've mentioned funds, international banking, aircraft leasing, securitization, payments and uh, technology. And I think also, you know, we've recognised that we've, we've, got to, we've got to keep moving ahead to stay in the same place. Uh, one of the things that's needed is more, more people coming out of our colleges with good knowledge in mathematics. And the Minister of Education, the current government, is you know, taking on board the need to improve the attractiveness of math, mathematics as a subject to study, uh, likewise science, so that we will be producing a continuing flow of people, of at least the quality of your present uh, recruits, but also perhaps, perhaps, uh, perhaps even, even, even better. This represents, I think, a very high proportion, this industry, a very high proportion of all of the uh, foreign direct investment in Ireland. And Ireland, as you know, apart from Singapore, uh, is the, the main, the, the, 
biggest, got the, the biggest influx of foreign direct investment uh, of any country uh, in, the, in, 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 in the world uh, in, in, in the last year. Um, it was, we, but I think what, what we do need to, 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 to look at is the potential, and I'll conclude on this. We, we hear a lot from econom economists about finance and what's wrong, and is it strange that we really only pay attention to economists when there's a recession on? And that suggests to me that there's something about economics that maybe the economists don't know. And what I think that is, is that economists basically know little or nothing about economic growth. They know about, they can tell you what has happened, and sometimes they can tell you why it has happened, but they can't really tell you what are the things that will change uh, the future for the better. It's other professions, I think engineers, possibly auditors, um, marketing people that will identify where the growth is going to come from. But if we look at a few you know, fundamental facts about, about Europe, uh, I think we can see areas where its growth potential can be increased. Um, of Europeans between 55 and 64, and I'm now outside that age range on the wrong side, only 46% of Europeans between 55 and 64 are still working. Is it any wonder we have a slow growth in Europe if people who are well able to work cease working so young? Secondly, 53% of young Europeans would like to work in another country if they got a chance. But only 2.4% of Europeans ever do, of young Europeans ever do, work in another country because there's barriers to qualification, barriers of language, all sorts of barriers that prevent them doing it. Um, and I think we've got to look at those sorts of things and say, what can we do to remove the barriers to young people working, remove the barriers to older people working, remove people's inhibitions about what they feel they can do, help them to, not just to acquire new skills, but to have a new perception of themselves to enable them to achieve more. Those are the things that I think will enable Europe's economies to grow, economy to grow, and I think it is a change in attitudes of mind more than almost anything else that we need if our, our economy is to grow, and I hope that you know, discussions like this can help us uh, bring that eventuality a little bit nearer. Thank you.